How's it going? I'm excited all the time. Am I too loud? Yeah. I'm too loud. You are. Can you turn me down? Because I don't talk quiet well. Uh, man, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having us. Uh, it's not two doctorates, I promise. I'm not that smart. Uh, it is two graduate degrees. I have two master's degrees and just started the doctorate. Um, but I'm so glad to be here. We, uh, we just love church. And I think a lot of people, when they love church, especially as pastors and speakers, I'm not trying to be negative, they love the big atmosphere and all the people and worship, and that's awesome. But we just love church. Like, I love sitting in a small group with three people because that's church if Jesus is there with us. I love sitting in a coffee shop and praying and doing the Bible study because that's church. We go out when we're here in Phoenix in between our trips overseas. We go out in the streets of Phoenix and we pray with the homeless and we help people who are in sex traffic and get off the streets. And that's church. Let me tell you, we've gotten together with eight or nine of our team and sat there in the streets of Cass, which is the most dangerous part of Phoenix. The fire department won't even go in there without police staging if there's an emergency. We go out there at night, 7, 8, all the way to 10 or 11 at night, and we just sit there and fight worship in the streets. And you watch people who are literally addicted and afflicted and abused and abandoned coming out of places. You're like, where did they even come from? And they're worshiping, and they're being touched by Jesus. They're getting off the streets. They're getting to live. That's church. Amen? Yeah. So we always say when we have church, we don't put it in a box. The only box that needs to be checked is are we worshiping the true living God who gave us salvation through Jesus Christ? Amen. Because if that box is checked, then we're having church. Amen. So I love being here. Uh, I'm so excited. I, don't, I, I just think that it's such a privilege and an honor to go anywhere. So thank you for having me and for listening and for worshiping with us. Uh, I could talk all day without ever getting to my scripture, but that's not biblical. And if it isn't the Bible, then we shouldn't be talking about it. So let's get into it. We're going to read out of the book of John, chapter 21. I didn't tell them the verse, so it's not on the screen. It's my fault. Uh, I take the blame. So John, <laughs> chapter 21, verses 1 through 9. And I read out of the English standard version because it's what we use in school. And I'm too much of a nerd to ever change. Uh, are you ready? All right. It says, after this... Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Okay, that's the introduction. Now it's story time. So just picture it, okay? Put yourself there. It says, Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, that is James and John, and two of the other disciples were gathered together. And Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. <laughs> Quite a declaration. And they said to him, we will go with you. So they went out and got into a boat. But that night they caught nothing. And just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? And the disciples answered and screamed, No! And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boats, and there you will find some. So they cast the net, and they were not able to haul it in because of the great quantity of fish. And the disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore said to Peter, It is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment because he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. And the other disciples came along in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards away. You see, what an interesting stage. Like, I'll have set the stage, because you can't have a play unless you know what's going on in the background. Jesus is gone, right? Jesus has walked with the disciples for about three years, and suddenly he just, see you guys, I gotta go die for you. And the disciples are like, well, what do we do now? What do we do? Have you ever been in a place where you've been walking with Jesus and then suddenly in your life and in your walk, it feels like Jesus isn't there. And you're like, God, where have you gone? Where are you? Where are you? You see, sometimes God has to step away from the situation to see if your character has developed enough to continue where he's taking you to go. He has to say, okay, let me take a step back and see how you do, continuing to carry the fruit and the Holy Spirit that I put inside of you when I'm not standing over you. 
So suddenly they're feeling like the voice of God is gone, and they go, well, what do we do? So Peter, because he always says what exactly he thinks, doesn't he? Like, Peter, I always tell people, I'm more of a John guy, like, I just love Jesus. Peter, man, whether he was right or wrong, he knew what he believed. Yeah. I'm going to jump out on the water, I'm going to cut a guy's ear off, like, Peter, this is what I'm doing. You can be for or against it, but this is happening. So Peter says, I'm going fishing. What an interesting decision. So Jesus is gone, and what's Peter decided? He decides to go fishing. Why? Because that is what he did before Jesus ever came. Can I tell you, oftentimes when it feels like we're struggling and when we're alone in our walk as Christians, the devil is going to tempt us and say, why don't you just come back to where you were before you met Jesus? Why don't you come back to where I had you? Why don't you come back to where it's comfortable and where it's cozy and you know what's going on? We cannot go back to where we were before Jesus found us. We cannot go back to the place that we were before the calling of God. You cannot go to where you've already been. You may not be where God is taking you yet, but you are a step further every day. Don't go backward. Don't slide back. Continue to press on toward the goal. Even when there is silence, even when you have doubts, you just keep pressing. You keep pushing. So keep moving forward. But in addition, Peter goes back to a place of comfort. Anybody ever gone to a place where you're comfortable? Can I tell you, there's no such thing as calm and comfortable. God will not call you and keep you comfortable. The purpose that God has for your life is about a million miles out of your comfort zone. Right? Because I was like, okay, God, I don't talk. I have people looking at me now like, really? Like, I graduated high school. I had people, you can ask her, people run into us that knew me in high school. They're like, that's Alex? Yeah. He never talked. I think he said three words to me in the four years we went to school again. I didn't talk. I had a stutter and a lisp. I was terrible. Uh, okay, God, you know what? I'll be really good at praying. And at the time I play drums, God, I'll play drums on the worship team even. Like, this is what I'll do. I'll write music. It'll be great. God's like, no. That's your comfort zone. There's no growth in a place where you're comfortable. So therefore, I have to take you further. I have to take you out of your comfort zone. So Peter went back to his comfort zone. Saying, well, I don't know where Jesus is, so I'm just going to go back. And the second he did that, he was outside of the calling of God. You see, you have to understand, you're one uncomfortable step away from being in the calling of Jesus. You know, you, some of us are like, this is how church service is supposed to go. This is how it's supposed to be. And God is saying, listen, if you'll just take one uncomfortable step to the side, then people are going to start coming in that actually need the gospel. And people are going to come in and see their lives transformed. Because you decided to get uncomfortable and do something that was out of the routine. You reached people that were out of the routine. Yeah. I read a study, because I'm a nerd, from yeah. Barna Research, which is a big church, like worldwide evangelism survey company. Their statistics are incredibly accurate. That's one of the reasons we use them. And the statistic, which was done a few years ago, so it's probably gotten even worse, says if every single church in America did Sunday service perfectly, like at a, the, the highest level you can think of, worship is off the charts and the seats are packed out, you know the percentage of Americans that would be reached with the gospel? Yeah. 12 to 18%. Mm -hmm. The other 82 Oh, well, I guess that they're in trouble. But God didn't say, hey, do church perfectly and reach the ones you can. He said, go into all the world, to every tribe, every tongue, every nation, and yeah. preach the word of God and see the salvation come to mankind. So when we're in our comfort zone church, there's 82% of the population that will never have a chance to hear the gospel. We're one uncomfortable step away from reaching somebody new. When we get outside of our comfort zones. What will you do when you're confronted with the problem? So, I'm going to take a break from Peter, right? Peter, he's calm, but he's decided to go back to a comfort place in Baxland. But let's talk about these other guys. These dudes, they weren't even fishermen. <laughs> like, I don't know about you guys, I've been this person. That's why I preach on it. I've been this person. Somebody's like, well, I'm really confused. I'm going to go do this. And I'm like, well, I don't have a better idea. I guess I'll go with you. <laughs> yeah, you ever, have you ever been to Entourage? Like, well, that's a really dumb idea, Peter, but I ain't gotten anything better. <laughs> Let's go. Because they were just going to 
got to stick in a place where it's comfortable. You see, these guys are following Peter down a backslide. Stop being a follower. I, I, I always preach this, especially like teenagers and things. Don't be a follower of the culture and the people around you. Because oftentimes we end up in a place where we're like Peter and we're going, okay, I guess I'll go back to what I was doing before. And the second that all of those people go back into sin, we're like, well, I can't stand out here by myself. I guess I'll go along with them. And God is saying, listen, just because the leader may be going back, don't abandon your post. Continue to press on. Continue to pursue the things of God. Don't just follow people to the next big mistake. Follow God to the next big miracle. Yeah. Amen? Amen? You can't follow somebody else to your calling. Nope. You can't, right? Because I'm called to train up pastors across the world. It's really cool. I'm really a nerd, so I love it. Because I'm like, I can just sit here and be a Bible geek and not be made fun of for it. Which is really awesome. It's not, even in churches, they're like, oh, this nerd's here. But like there, they're like, oh, I want to learn. So it's cool that I'm a geek. Pastor Mike is not called to that, right? He's called to different, different things. He's called to be here right now. If Pastor Mike tried to follow me around to the calling that God had for him, he'd end up in a bunch of countries where he didn't speak the language and he didn't fit in and he would be confused and he would out, be outside of the calling of God. You cannot follow somebody else to the calling and purpose that God has for your life. So don't be a follower except for following Jesus. Amen. Amen? So, now that I'm done talking about the backsliding, I love this scene. I told you, originally when Jesus called Peter, it says he forsook his boat, right? It says, it literally says, Peter forsook his boats along with the other disciples, and they followed Jesus. What does forsake mean? In the Hebrew, or Greek, because it's New Testament, the way it would break down is they literally basically burned their boats. They burned the ships. They said, we are lighting this on fire. We are leaving it behind. We will never return. Isn't it funny how the second we start backsliding, the devil's like, oh, you know that thing you never said you'd go back to? Here it is. Oh, you said those people you'd never go back to? Here it is. You have to understand that there's a difference between forsaking in the sense of physically burning it and deciding in your heart and your spirit, I will never go back and committing yourself to that every day. Yeah. Amen? Amen. So sometimes we think, oh, I, I deal with this a lot on the street with addicts. So like, oh, I'm never going back to cocaine. And I'm like, okay, are you ready to leave the street and get in rehab? No. Well, then you're going to go back. You're just talking. There has to be an action and a decision and a motivation that says, I am done being in my past, and I am not going back. And when the devil confronts me and says, oh, doesn't this look nice, that I can keep pushing ahead and not be tempted by the things that I left behind. Amen? Amen. Are you close enough to the voice of Jesus to continue to press on even when you don't hear him? Mm -hmm. <sighs> All right, y'all. You, you excited? I'm excited if you can't tell. I'm like, fired up. <laughs> Y'all are quiet. And you haven't been in Africa yet. I know. I'm fired up and I didn't go to Africa. This is my state of being, if you ask my wife. She gets really annoyed. Oh! So, I just... God's, God's speaking as I'm, I'm saying. I feel like sometimes we go back to this place and we say, well, God can still use us here. And it isn't even in my notes. That's why I'm like, okay, hold on. God can still use us here. Like... I'm called to the nations. I, I stayed on staff at a church for years. I've been on staff at different churches since I was 18. I can go back. Oh, God's still using me. Man, life groups are going. Youth is pumping out people. This is awesome. But I can still be outside of the calling and the purpose that God has for my life. And I feel like some of us have said, but God, I'm scared of the calling and I'm scared of the purpose. So I'm going to stay in the comfort zone because I can still make a difference. And I don't know who you are, but stop. It is time to step out and say, God, I will go wherever you want to take me. I will do whatever you want me to do. And I will say whatever you want me to say. And God, I pray that your word is like what Jeremiah said, a fire shot up in my bones, that I can't even contain it if I wanted to. Amen? Amen. I don't know who that was for, but back to my notes. When I do look at them and don't make things up. I promise it's five. We've got to make it up. I spent a lot of time reading it. Um, <coughs> so... Peter the fisherman gets out on the boat in the middle of the night. He is working. He is working. He is working. He is fishing. And his nets come up empty. 
over and over and over. Have you ever set out to do something and still come up empty? And you try with all your might, like, I want this to happen. And you work hard and you slave at it. And you say, I'm going to invest everything I can in this and I'm going to make it work. And it still fails. And you still come up empty. Yes. I, I, I'm sure we've all been there at some point, right? I feel that way oftentimes raising a child. I'm like, I don't even... Know what to do anymore. Uh, I can speak languages in Africa and I can go to nations and sit 30 hours on a plane, but you cry for 30 seconds and I don't know what to do. <laughs> God saying, listen, you're doing everything you can do and still coming up empty because you're doing it on your own. You may be working the extra shifts. You might spend all night trying to get somewhere and to accomplish something. And what's happening is you're still coming up empty. And then you end up exhausted. Anybody ever ended up exhausted because they work too hard? Amen. And you end up feeling like you have nothing left. And you get this feeling of hopelessness where you're just ground down and you give up. But I always find it interesting that they slave away all night in the darkness and in the problems. Because that's what the night represents. It's the darkness and the absence of Jesus. But in the morning... Oh, but in the morning, something happens when the light shows up because yeah. the light of the world showed up and changed everything. And so these guys are slaving away all night long, all night for nothing. But then in the morning, something changes. There's something there. And they look over and they see a man standing on the shore. And so... Jesus calls out to them. They don't even know. Children, do you have any fish? Children, did all of your work and all of your slaving away and did all of you trying to do it yourself, did it work? And I give the disciples a lot of credit because at least they knew when to say no. No, it didn't work without you. No, it didn't work. We slaved and we tried and it didn't work. But I really love the word Jesus uses. He doesn't say Oh, hey, Peter, the betrayer. Right? He had just betrayed Jesus. He doesn't say, oh, hey, you who have gone back into sin and got back to the place that you were before. He doesn't say, he says, children, I'm not going to recognize you by your mistake. I'm not going to recognize you by the place you are right now. I'm not going to recognize you by the things you've done in the past. I'm going to recognize you as who I've called you to be. And I've called you to be children. Amen. That's why it says that children... Inherit the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus says, children, do you have any fish? Can I tell you, it doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter where you are right now. It does not matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how far out of the calling of God you may have strayed. God is saying right now, you are my child. I have chosen you. I have called you. I have ordained a purpose for you. That's why Jeremiah 29, 11 says, for, well, I almost quoted John 3, 16. And now I spaced it. He goes, I know the plans and the purpose I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. And then Jeremiah 29, 13, because we want it in context always, says, when you, when you seek me, you will find me when you seek me with your whole heart. Amen. If you want to seek the purpose and the heart and the goals that God has for you, you have to seek him yourself. So suddenly, Jesus just shows up. Isn't it funny? How oftentimes the second we need to seek Jesus, he's just hanging out right there. Like, you ready? 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 Did it work? Did it work on your own? No? Okay, you want to come here? You want to come on now? You ready? It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you've done. God is saying, I still have a purpose for you. I have still called you. I have still chosen you. You are still anointed. Come on. Calling and the purposes of God are irrevocable. Therefore, are you ready? Amen. So did it work? And this, this probably, in my honesty, is my favorite part because I love, I'm a sinner and I have problems. I'm human. And, and you'll, so you'll get this. So Jesus looks at him and he goes, well, if it didn't work, why don't you throw the net on the other side of the boat? <laughs> so I understand that they were just obedient. Praise God. But it, I just imagine being Peter. Like, this is the dude that's like, you're not taking Jesus and chopping guys, and you're off. He's very like, nope, you're not doing that. Imagine Peter, who has been a fisherman all of his life. He is a professional at this. It said he had numerous boats. 
He was like the man in the Sea of Galilee. He was a fisherman. This is what he did. This is what he knew. It's like somebody showing up that doesn't understand the Bible. Like, well, you're misinterpreting it. It's like, well, I read Hebrew and Greek, and I studied it in multiple languages. Don't tell me that. And I'm imagining Peter. He has slaved all day long on this boat. He has worked. He has done every trick he knows. And this guy who he has no idea who he is shows up on the shore and goes, Hey, why don't you throw the net on the other side? What? And when Peter, I'm like throwing things like, I'm going to get that guy. You think, I, you think I don't know how to fish? You think I can't do this? You think suddenly I'm going to walk three feet over and I'm going to catch a bunch of fish? You think I even tried that already? I can just imagine Peter, because he's obedient, but I, I, I think of the character, and I imagine him just, mm, I'm going to throw the net on the other side, I'm going to show him. And I'm gonna, he throws the net over, and he's still grumbling, oh, this net's going to come up empty again, and then I'm going to show this guy, you don't know what you're talking about, I'm a fisherman. <laughs> and then he starts to pull the net. And then, there's a lot of fish, and suddenly he freezes. Wait a second, how did that work? Because Peter has to know as a fisherman, he has done everything right and it still came up empty. He has slaved away and still come up empty. So therefore, for him to suddenly have fish, it was not a physical change. It wasn't a worldly change. Because he had come over, he had gone over every possible worldly option as a fisherman. You don't just suddenly get empty nets for 12 hours and then get 300 fish. That's not how fishing works. <laughs> So Peter freezes, and he looks over, and there's a few times that this happens in Scripture, and Peter looks over at John. John, I, I, I can just, once again, I, I just imagine the character, I just imagine John giving this big old smile, and he looks at Peter and goes, yeah, what you're thinking is right, that's the Lord, that is the Lord. It says, the beloved who knew the voice of Jesus said, that is the Lord. There's one other time that we see Peter look at John, and John asks a question, and it's the Last Supper. Jesus goes, one of y'all is going to betray me. And they're all freaking out. Oh my God, is it me? Is it you? Is it me? You think, I, 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 Jesus knows my thoughts. I don't even know if it's me, but he knows if it's me. They're all freaking out. And they all look, and Peter looks at John. And they all go, well, it's not John. John's not freaking out. You notice that? All of the disciples in this picture are freaking out except John, who's just reclining on Jesus. Why? Because he knows it's not him. You have confidence in your relationship with Jesus, and you know it's not you. So Peter looks to John, who knows Jesus well enough, and says, ask him who the betrayer is. And John goes and talks to Jesus, and that's how they find out. And then you see it again right here. It's the only other time. They catch all these fish. And John just sitting there, and it says, Peter basically looks over at him. And John just says, it's the Lord. I know it's the Lord. So suddenly, and this is when it all gets to, I've told you a story to get you to this point. Because this is, I call this my one-point sermon. I know people give you three and four-point outlines. I'm a one-point kind of guy, because I just want you to remember it. Peter has to make a decision. Right? He's in his comfort zone. He's in the boat. He is full of fish. And suddenly, right in this moment, he has to decide, am I going to stay in my comfort zone, or am I going to jump out? Am I going to stay with the provision and the fish, or am I going to go to the provider? Am I going to go with the wealth, or am I going to go with the one that is worth everything? Am I going to stay in the place and the success of the world and in my comfort zone, or am I going to make a decision that says it, the wealth doesn't matter, the success doesn't matter, the comfort doesn't matter. I will go overboard what the world thinks is reasonable for Jesus. I will jump out of the boat of normalcy and complacency, and I will go after Jesus no matter what it costs me, no matter what I leave behind. I will swim, and I will work, and even if the other disciples Stay behind. I will not stop until I reach Jesus. Amen. Peter has to make a decision. Will I go overboard? It's really what the world's asking. Are you? Because from the world perspective, I'm overboard for Jesus. I am way too much. Like, I'll be real with you. I'll walk down the street and light my life hurts. Can you take me to a doctor? I'm like, no, but I'll have a Pentecostal pray for you. And if Pentecostal doesn't work, I will get Pentecostal. Uh -huh. Anybody ever had somebody Pentecostal? Like, oh, you're sick? <laughs> I'm just kidding. But there is a decision that has
has to be made. And from the world's perspective, they're saying, oh, these Christians, if they fall in line, they're all right. They just, you know, the, the world and the enemy doesn't worry about us when we just sit in church. They don't worry about Peter and the boat. Oh, that's a place you're comfortable. That's a place you're complacent. That's a place that you are comfortable and happy and you're not going to do any damage. Right. And for so long, and I'll say this all over the world, I promise I'm not picking on you. We as Christians and as the church have said, well, we'll just stay in the boat. You know, because when we leave the boat, people get mad. When we leave the boat, people start persecuting us. When we leave the boat, there's a lot to be afraid of. There's waves and there's big fish. I, I remember that Jonah story. It's kind of scary. Um, and we said, well, I don't want to leave the boat. I don't want to leave the church. I don't want to leave my comfort zone. I don't want to preach Jesus on the streets. I don't want to share Jesus in my workplace. That's leaving the boat. That's, uh, that's overboard. And people look at me different, and they think of me different. And I'm almost losing my nose. But then he has to make his decision. He really does. He's sitting here. All the other disciples stay. How do people always say? They kind of, oh, let us, let's, let's think through it. Peter's like, I'm going or I'm not going. All the disciples say, I feel so often our excuse for not going further after Jesus is like, well, this is what my church does. Well, this is what I've always been taught. This is tradition. This is what the religious side says. I, I always tell people I'm a nerd, but the real reason I went to school is I grew up in a really legalistic church. And I'm like, is this really how it works? Because it's all nothing to do with God. That, that's, that's my part. I'm just being real with you. I went, there's no way that it has to fit into this cookie cutter mold. Because I do not fit into a cookie cutter mold, if you cannot tell. I'm different. But God's people are called to be different. They're called to go overboard. They're called to say, you know what? I've sat on the boat, and I've been complacent, and I've been in my comfort zone. And I've even had the provision and the overflow of Jesus' blessings sitting on my boat. But there's a time to decide, will I go overboard for Jesus? Will I leave it all behind <laughs> just to pursue the Messiah? Will I leave it all behind just to get closer to him, just to have a relationship with him, just to sit down with him and have a conversation? And so Peter, in this moment, he doesn't care about the past. He hasn't, he's hardly seen Jesus. He betrayed Jesus. Hasn't been restored yet. Literally, this is a guy who, despite being his boat now overflowing with the provision of Jesus and the blessing of Jesus, and he could stay there the rest of his life and be comfortable. He instead says, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to leave my past behind. I'm going to confront it and make a decision that my past will not stop me. My past will not limit me. I will not be defined by my mistakes, but I will be defined as a person who leaves behind the things the world says I have to stay with and goes overboard in my pursuit of Jesus. I don't want to challenge you today. Are we ready as a church and as the people of God to say, I'm not going to stay in my box. I'm not going to stay in my comfort zone. But when I see the Messiah, I am going overboard to pursue him. I will spend hours in prayer to pursue him. I will leave behind the, I will leave behind the blessings of the world that maybe even God himself gave me to see myself closer to him. Amen. Uh, we learned this one a lot in missions because we've been full-time missionaries three months. We are not fully fundraised yet. Nope. Praise God. Because what I learn every time it comes up is, well, we're not dependent on the things of the world. We're not dependent on my salary. We're not dependent on my benefits. Well, I left my job, which is a crazy thing to do, especially with a young family, but we're dependent on the Lord. I'll leave behind the blessings of the world. I'll leave behind the blessings God gave us. We have given more to the kingdom of God as in the last three months as missionaries than we ever gave before. Despite the fact we don't even know if we're getting paid, we're like, come Oh, we just ran into you. God said to give you this three thousand dollar check. Here you go. And I'm not saying that. And that's an example. It's not real. Uh, I wish I had three thousand dollars to give to somebody. But I'm saying that to say, listen, will you leave behind stuff? Because so often we're like, well, I want to pursue God with everything, but I want a ten thousand dollar pad in my savings account in case something gets ugly. And I really challenge people. Hey, it's awesome. I always tell people, steward wisely. I'm not saying give away everything, but steward wisely. But generosity breaks down barriers. Like, I, I, can, I can do a whole other sermon. Generosity breaks down barriers in the kingdom. We've seen so many people, well, they wouldn't have anything to do with us. But we went there week after week after week and said, here's a bag of food. Can we pray for you? Oh, you need hygiene stuff? We'll bring that next week when we see you. And 
three months later, they're like, okay, I'm ready to come out. I'm ready to come off the street. I want to get recovered. And they have been in Christian recovery. And now I know several of them are becoming pastors as they've gone through the discipleship program for months. God is saying, will you leave behind what the world says you have to hold on to to pursue me with everything? Amen. Will you go overboard? Do you want the provision or do you want the provider? Do you want the comfort? Or do you want the great comforter? Do you want the things of the world? Or do you want Jesus? And you can have, I mean, Peter and John and all of them knew who Jesus were. But they were still distant from him. We can know who Jesus is and still be distant from him. So, Peter, I, I always tell people, he takes the plunge. Well, you, no, I've, I've always called it that. But I just felt like it was very youth campish. Will you take the plunge? used to be the name of this sermon. And, but Peter just does. He's like, okay, that's Jesus. He's throwing his shirt on as he's running off the boat. <laughs> like, literally, like, uh, I'm sure the disciples are like, dude, where are you going? And he just, he doesn't even answer. He's just overboard. Uh, part of me wonders, like, well, how much faster than the boat could Peter actually swim? Like, he, I, I don't know, imagine the boat goes pretty quick. And Peter is swimming, and he is going with everything. And I'm sure he's going through his head, man, I really messed up. I don't even know if Jesus will want me back. I don't even know if he'll take me back. But he swims, and he pursues. And when he gets there, Jesus looks at him. Hey, Peter. And there's fish on the fire. <laughs> and, he, and Jesus looks at him. And this is, this is where the, that great restoration moment comes. He goes, Peter, do you love me? And he's like, yeah, God. Yeah, I do. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? And he asks him three times for the three times he's betrayed. And Peter's restored. And he's restored because he pursued Jesus with everything. He said, listen, Jesus, I don't care about the past. I just want to chase you. I just want to pursue you. And oftentimes we leave everything and we're like, God, I don't even know if I'm going to eat. And Jesus is sitting there going, oh, you came after me. But all the provision and all that you needed and all that you needed to be able to do what I've called you to do was already waiting here at my feet when you got here. Will we go overboard for Jesus? Will we say to the world, hey, that is great. Ooh, I'm throwing stuff. Look out. We're getting real Pentecostal. Um, will we leave behind the things of the world? Will we leave behind the things that have held us back and kept us comfortable? And will we go after Jesus with everything, even if it means we leave things behind that we love and that we cherish in our flesh and say, God, I don't care. I have to go where you've called me to go, and I have to be who you've called me to be, and I don't care what limits and restraints I have put on myself or the world has tried to put on me. I will go. I will jump overboard. They will think I'm crazy, and I don't even care because it will get me closer to Jesus. It will get me where I'm called to be. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. You guys believe that? Stand with me for a minute. Yeah, you can do your piano thing. Whatever that's called. Playing. Uh, <laughs> uh, sometimes I went I think, I, sometimes I think I went to college, other times I'm like, did I graduate high school? <laughs> what was that word? Um, I just I say this, and I say this everywhere I go. It's not personal, but it's personal. I'm not, I sound like I walked into Refuge Church and thought, oh, them Refuge people, they don't tell anybody about Jesus. Oh, them Refuge people, they really need to get out of their comfort zone and get out of the church. It, it, I, I, didn't, I just speak the words that God tells me to when I get someplace. This isn't a message that I was like, I don't think you're good enough and you're not doing it. But at the same time, it's personal because it's still a message that God gave and it still impacts your life. And God is saying, will you step out of your comfort zone? Will you step out of your boat? And we all have them. I still have certain boats and certain comfort zones that God is saying, will you step out of this? Will you step out of your tradition? Will you step out of the religious monotony and the cookie cutter mentality and say, whatever it takes to pursue Jesus and see his kingdom come on earth, I will do it. I don't care if it's unconventional. I don't care if the world thinks I'm crazy. I don't care if the church thinks I'm crazy. I'm sure the other disciples are looking at Peter like, what is he doing? But you know, sure enough, it's Peter that Jesus says, but upon this rock, I will build my church. It's you that's going to carry that and be that foundation. Because he was crazy. Will we go overboard and be crazy in the world, of, the eyes of the world and the eyes of other churches and maybe other Christians? 
and say, I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what it takes. I don't care what it costs. I will do what God has called me to do, and I will be who God has called me to be. And no matter what, I will pursue Jesus and draw closer to him every single day of my life until I'm close to him in heaven. That's the challenge. So I just want to pray with y'all. I'm not going to make y'all come up or anything. I'm old school like that, but I'm not going to do that. I just want to challenge you. And I'm going to share a quick story, and then I'm going to be done. I'm going to tell you a story that I wasn't going to share today, but it's a story we're going to name Tatum. And this young girl was born to an addict. She was injected with drugs from the time she was born until she was four years old to keep her from crying. She was... Basically, her mother, when she would use it, the baby started crying and just give her a dose of heroin to keep her quiet. And Tabor eventually got caught and it was found out by DCS and she went into foster home. She bounced around for years. She finally got adopted off at seven years old. At seven years old, she was adopted off into a family that abused her physically, emotionally, mentally, and sexually. Until she was 18. When she went to the doctor at 18, and they did an x-ray, they said there could be up to 100 breaks that haven't go properly. We can't even count them because of the amount of damage that's done to your body from head to toe. And during her, her teenage years and things, Tabor attempted suicide multiple times. She said, I am hopeless, I am lost, and I am broken. And she tried to go to church, and it was just a routine. And she tried to go places, and Christians tried to reach her. But then there was somebody that said, listen, I'm not going to try and make you fit in a box. I know you don't want to be in church on that Sunday service. I just want to sit down with you and pursue Jesus with you. I just want to challenge you. I just want to see God move in your life. And however that looks for you, as long as it's biblical, I'm okay with it. They broke the mold, and people made fun of those leaders. And they said, oh, you can't, you can't save that one. They said, you can't save that one. You're out of, you're out of your, your league. You're out of your box. The church can't reach that. But somebody said, I'm not going to stay in the boat. I'll go overboard and I'll save them. And I will swim with them to Jesus. And some of us were like, well, we're swimming after Jesus. Yeah, but are you picking up the person on your back and taking them with you? Because Tabor is playing your piano. My, my wife's birth name was Destiny Tabor. It was changed to Destiny Hayden when she was adopted. It became Destiny Kennedy when she married me. She was that person that the church looked at and said, you've got no hope, you are broken, you are lost. Don't even try and leave your church box to save her because you can't and you won't. Religion can't save her. That she doesn't fit into the tradition. But somebody looked and said, I will break down every wall. I will tear down the walls of Jericho hand by hand if I have to. I will leave the boat. I will break down the religious monotony. I will break down the tradition and I will go reach her where she is. And as, as they swam to Jesus, she swam to Jesus with them. That's how the world's transformed. That's how the world has changed. By people who say, I'm going overboard for Jesus and I'm taking somebody with me. So I just want to pray with y'all. And then we'll worship a little bit. Lord Jesus, I just thank you for, for your presence in this place. I thank you that you're just moving in lives and hearts today. And I pray right now, Lord Jesus, that you challenge every single one of us to say we will not stay in the boat any longer. We will not go back to where we have been. We will not stay in a place that is comfortable, but we will walk into our calling. We will jump overboard in the world's perspective just to pursue you. We will give whatever it takes. We will leave it all behind to chase the cross, to chase the calling, and to chase a relationship with you, Lord Jesus. And I pray as we jump overboard, Lord Jesus, that you will give us those people who the world thinks is drowning, who the world thinks are hopeless. They feel like they can't swim and that we can just carry them on our back and we say, and say it's okay, I'm not going to let you drown. I will pick you up and I will carry you to Jesus and you will encounter him and nothing will ever be the same. Make us those people, God, because it's not about a pastor, it's not about a church building, it's about us as the people of God saying, yes, I will go. Send me, Lord. I don't have to be a pastor. I don't have to be credentialed. I just have to say yes. So, Lord, in this place, I just pray you touch every heart. And that you may, and online, that you touch every heart. You just make us say yes, Lord. We will go over, Lord. We 
will do all that you have called us to do. We will say yes, and we will go overboard after you. In Jesus' name, amen. Here is where I lay down every burden, every cry. This is my surrender. This is my surrender. Here is where I lay down every lie and every doubt. This is my surrender. Every time, this I bring is in, every time I bring in a, a special guest speaker, it seems like they always tell us the same thing. We got to step out. We got to change. We can't be who we are and expect things to be different. We can't be a church with a little mind and expect big things to happen. We can't do it. Speaker after speaker, Jimmy Ars told us this, Gabriel Knight told us this, I told you this over and over and over again, we've got to change, we've got to be different, Einstein says and Halley says, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results, we've got to step out of our comfort zone, we've got to change our tradition, we've got to surrender it all to God, about Three months ago, I went to our bishop and I told him our, our Spanish pastor isn't helping us. He's not the same religion as us. He has different beliefs. And I just can't get him to help us. And we're in a Spanish community and we need someone to help. We need something different. Um, so it's been a process, but this morning they brought in God, they brought Pastor Joel to introduce me to him, and he's going to be coming here to help us out. He's going to be a, and he's got the beliefs, I think, that we talked just a little this morning, that he understands that we're going to step out and we're going to do things in this community. We're going to change lives, but God needs not only me and him, he needs you guys. He needs the people who are missing today who aren't here. I hope you guys are watching. We need you guys to step out of your comfort zone to do things that you wouldn't normally do, to surrender at all. This song, I don't know if Alex is taking this song on purpose and doesn't fit his message so well or not, but I don't think he did. <laughs> but this whole service, even I went off on it, this whole service just fit around this song. And Alex is shaking his head, and I didn't think so because God just does that stuff, guys. He just does it. When we step out of our comfort zone, God changes things. God has ways of talking to us like this song in special ways. But um, so I just pray for you guys. I just pray that God opens up missions for you guys. We, we're here. I, I told you guys we're here. Our mission is to grow, to grow others, and to increase heaven's population. That's what we're doing. Uh, when I get to heaven, I want it to be a party. And the biggest party is to have the most people. So I want more people at my party, right? Let's pray. Dear Father, we love you, Lord, and we just thank you, Father, for the word today, Father. We thank you, Lord, that you're not bog we're not bogged down by tra traditions with you, Father God, but, but you, you've given us, like, the opportunity to just be ourselves, Father. You said, be you, Father. And you're like, be you, Michael. Be you, Alex. Do what you do, and I'll make it happen. Like, you don't have to be somebody else to make it happen, Lord. We're so thankful, Lord, that you've told us that. And we can be ourselves, Father. But tradition shows us that, oh, no, you need to be like someone else. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you break those barriers, Father. That you let, let us release that tradition, Father. That you just let us run with who we are, Lord. And that you, you bring in callings to our life, Lord, that we never imagined possible, Lord. And that we grow this place, this city, Lord. You placed us in the fastest growing city in the world. We've got to be. We've got to be a growing church. When we're in the fastest growing city in the world, but we don't do it on our own, Lord. We're like Peter fishing all night. So we pray, God, that you show up and you give us our calling and you tell us to do exactly what you've made us to do. Lord, it's so funny that, that Peter was doing exactly what he was made to do, exactly what he had done over and over and over again. But he couldn't catch anything until you showed up. 
So we're inviting you to show up, Lord. Lord, help us do what we already know how to do. Help us do it in our own special, unique ways, in our own callings, Father God. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thanks, guys, for being here this week. God, uh, I love you all. Pray for the pray for the pitmen. Keep the prices in, their, in your prayers. There's Sunday. We just going through some stuff. Um, and just show up next week. God's going to do great things. I really, really do.